Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode of the Into the Impossible podcast. I am your fearful host. Brian Keating, professor of physics at UC San Diego, and also the co-director of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, where this podcast originates. And today's a special treat because, uh, again, how often do you get to interview one of your best friends in the whole world who's traveling all over the world as we speak, uh, doing uh, a mission of peace and trying to unite the world uh, through his work. He's my friend, none other than uh, than Robert De Laurentiis, joining us today from sort of, in some sense, the midpoint on this trip. But geographically, we'll talk about exactly how that's unfolded. Uh, Robert, how are you today? Where are you joining us from? I'm in uh, Gotland, Sweden, Brian, which is uh, an island off the east coast of Sweden, making my way towards the uh, North Pole for my uh, crossing. That's probably going to happen sometime in July. So you set out uh, months ago to unite the world in a very special mission, and that mission took you to the bottom of the world, a place that I've been to. Uh, I've also been to Sweden looking for my own Nobel Prize. We're not going to get into that, um, uh, although you did pay a visit to the to the uh, museum there trying to snag me a, a, a copy of uh, a replica, at least. That's probably the closest I'll ever get to it nowadays. Um, Tell us where, how the mission originated, not just here in San Diego, but where did the idea for the, 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 the flight around the world and the so-called peace pilot uh, that you're now undertaking pole to pole, where did that come from? What, what caused you to come up with this idea as a mission for your own personal, uh, for your own you know, personal desires, but also for the global desires that you have? Brian, uh, you know I've written a book called Flying Through Life, and one of the premises of the book was to pursue the impossibly big dream. And after the uh, 2015 circumnavigation of the planet along the equator, uh, we you know, reflected back on the successes we had and what we learned, and we wanted to continue to pursue that impossibly big dream. So after you've done a circumnavigation of the equator, the next logical thing to do is to go uh, pole to pole, from, in my case, South Pole to North Pole. And, you know, we thought that was going to be relatively similar and set aside about six months to prepare for that. And uh, we're humbled several times in the process because we kept realizing it was many times more difficult to uh, cross the South Pole. So it was delayed a uh, total of 18 months. And now finally, I'm en route. I've been on the road for about seven months waiting for the temperatures at the North Pole to warm up. My good uh, buddy Brian Keating had told me the optimal time to cross the South Pole, and of course you were right. So, um, you know, I had planned to stay in Europe for a little while, and I didn't expect that the coronavirus would hit and make things, you know, more challenging for our film crew and for the effort. But I'm uh, dedicated to the mission and my 90 sponsors, uh, of which uh, you are one. So thank you for that. And, um, you know, things are looking good. The citizen of the world is behind me here, and it's in a museum hangar for the first time in its life, so we're really proud of that. It's uh, ready to rock and roll and, uh, you know, take on the North Pole. Actually, the magnetic North Pole, the true North Pole, and the North Pole of inaccessibility. Wow. Uh, what is, the, uh, what is the, um, the latter one, the North Pole of inaccessibility? I think people know the magnetic pole. They know that its existence from the existence of a compass needle's twist. Um, they know uh, p perhaps the geographic North Pole is where Santa Claus lives. No, it's, a, it's where the Earth axis uh, goes through uh, the two poles. It's the axis of rotation of the Earth. Uh, but what is the uh, pole of inaccessibility? The North Pole of inaccessibility is the center of um, if you imagine the landmass around the uh, the waters of the North Atlantic, there it would be the absolute furthest point from all the different land masses. I see. You so could probably explain that better than me, but <laughs> oh, I think that you did a good job there. Yeah, the similar concept. The South Pole is not the most inaccessible part of the of the Antarctic continent. Um, what is, uh, in your mind, when, when you set out to do this, this mission, you mentioned a film crew. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm more familiar with your books um, that we're going to get into, especially your uh, recently released children's book. 
uh, that we'll discuss. Um, but tell tell the audience uh, a little bit about what what is the plan for this documentary that you're participating in. You know, it started out as a 45 minute documentary, and we had hoped to film about five terabytes of film. And right now, at about two thirds of the way through the trip, we're at 10 terabytes. Mm-hmm. So we decided we would make it into a docu series. And I have a very talented film crew, a guy named uh, Jeremy Lazelle and Kristen Gates. And Jeremy used to work for uh, Discovery, National Geographic, and Animal Planet. And the name of the docuseries is Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond. Mm -hmm. And it's about the historic uh, polar circumnavigation of the citizen of the world that you see behind me. It's about the spiritual lessons that we learn in life from flying. And it's about the experiments that the citizen of the world carries and the records that she'll set. So it's also a scientific mission. And I know that you've partnered with scientists uh, from California, from NASA, uh, other um, uh, institutions. Can you tell us a little bit about the scientific mission that, uh, that the citizen of the world is conducting? Yeah, I'll uh, angle my screen down so you can see the uh, NASA logo uh, off to the side here. Um, as you know, Brian, you were instrumental in making that uh, happen. Uh, the scientists at UC Santa Barbara um, provided me with a wafer scale spaceship, which is mounted inside the citizen of the world on the co pilot side uh, window. And in the future of space travel, they're not going to send heavy rocket motors with rocket fuel and astronauts into space. Rather, they'll blast these small circuit boards that are about the size of your hand using an electromagnetic cannon or railgun out into space at the rate of you know, up to one every 15 minutes. And it's just a much more efficient way to explore space. The one that we have on the Citizen of the World uh, measures temperature, takes pictures, altitude, uh, speed, location, and a few other things. So it's really the first um, trip of this little wafer scale spaceship outside the campus of UC Santa Barbara. I know it's been up in a drone and a balloon, but uh, we're literally taking it, you know, pole to pole to the furthest reaches of the planet. So, well, to the South uh, Pole right behind you there. And then eventually it'll go uh, uh, into interstellar space. It'll pass the other planets in our solar system. And so I think you might have to rename uh, the, the aircraft to be the citizen of the universe after this. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really wonderful that you engage in this. Tell us a little bit about what, you know, this podcast focuses a lot, but not exclusively on science science. And as you know, my old joke about, you know, whether or not, you know, a scientist is outgoing or the way to tell if a scientist is outgoing is that he looks at your shoes when he talks to you instead of his own. Um, what do you, uh, what do you see as the, um, as the importance of science and, and having this mission uh, as part of your flight, and and do you believe that science can work uh, as Alfred Nobel did towards the betterment of mankind? Maybe perhaps through uh, even pursuing peace. Does science have a role in in Europe? And you're not a scientist; you're a layperson scientifically, um, although you have a great interest in science. And, and I'm going to give you an honorary PhD someday, I'm sure. Uh, but Thank you. I'm uh, ready to receive it, Brian. <laughs> doctor, Doctor Zen Pilot. <laughs> Uh, but tell us a little bit about uh, about what what is the value of science as you see it in the agitation towards peace. Well, you know, until I receive my degree from you, I'll be a citizen scientist, and you know, we're also carrying a particle experiment from Scripps Institute of Oceanography that tests for microfibers, and it was just coincidental or lucky that. I was in Spain during the, in the epicenter of the coronavirus in Europe. And one of the ways we got me out of there was letting the Spanish know that we would potentially be able to test for coronavirus on those plastic particles in the atmosphere. Mm. And that it was important that I leave at that moment in time, you know, to, to test for the, uh, the plastics. And I think that these world issues cannot be solved by an individual or a country or even a brilliant scientist. It takes the world working together. So in that way, you know, science brings us together. And when we look at our mission of one planet, one people, one plane, we see that the global issues that we face, you know, pull us closer together. 
And I know from talking to you that, you know, all the matter in the universe came from the Big Bang. So, you know, the cosmic material that makes us up unites us. And just like we have, um, you know, global issues that we deal with as a planet, we're also communicating globally right now, right? So communications connect us. Uh, the economy uh, connects us with other countries. So um, we are a... a um, we are citizens of the world, whether we like it or not. And I think that uh, dealing with these challenges also creates opportunities to bring us closer together. And that's a lot of what this mission is about. So uh, I want to take a little step back and go over your history. And uh, we've known each other coming up on 10 years now. I can't believe it. It's really flown yeah. by since you uh, uh, weren't a pilot when I first met you. And now uh, you've not only you know tripled quadrupled how many flight hours I have uh, in my, uh, my, my extensive flying career, such as it is. What gave you the courage to do this mission and the previous mission, which was to fly you know, horizontally the quote-unquote normal way that most people do it? I think there's probably exponentially fewer people that do what you're doing right now in terms of circumnavigation. What does it mean to you? What is the planet? The planet mostly is made of ocean uh, you were a lieutenant commander in the United States Naval uh, uh, Navy, and I wonder, you know, has this always been this wanderlust to to traverse the world? Has this literally been going through your veins since you were a little kid, or, or where does it come from? And and do you think you'll ever be able to scratch this itch for exploration? Yeah, that's a great question, Brian. I, um, you know, I had certain goals in my life. I wanted to make a certain amount of money uh, by a certain age, and um, you know, get to a point in my life where I could um, go and do things above and beyond, you know, just make a living. And I was blessed um, at about age 35 where I felt like I could, um, you know, start to move in a direction of, of retirement and give back in another way because I was thankful for what I had been given. So what I tried to do is just bring together my different passions, which were my business, spirituality, and flying. And um, in doing that, you know, I decided that I wanted to fly and further and further uh, with each attempt. And then finally, you know, the world um, was my focus. And the plane is really a billboard for our message. And I was taking a course in spiritual psychology and I was talking to my instructor and we were talking about exceeding, you know, our life's expectations. And I told him I was looking for a mission, and he said, how about world peace? And we both sort of laughed at that because it seemed unreachable. But uh, as time progressed, you know, and I got some experience, it started to see like, seem like something that I could, uh, you know, make an attempt at. And I didn't want to just be somebody who sat behind my computer. You know, I wanted to go out into the world and have impact. And just like you did with your bicep experiment at the South Pole and your experiments in Chile, um, I just felt like it was important to go in the world and make an attempt myself. You know, certainly people promise us they'll do things for the world, but this was my opportunity. And I figured that even if I failed, it still would have some impact. I would learn and hopefully inspire someone. Else. So um, I guess, you know, having the opportunity to go out into the world and make a change is the thing that really um, got me moving. Talk to us um, about, uh, as we often do, we talk to the ultimate performers in the world of science, but also in the world of art, writing, et cetera. Um, you mentioned your spiritual psychology, uh, you know, which, which uh, you and I have had discussions about and, you know, how scientific is it and how does that fold in? But one thing that is unquestionably gleaned in my experience from reading your previous two books and now your book, uh, your children's book, which we're reading to our children uh, from Uncle Robert. And we, ha we had a previous edition, which was the coloring book, uh, which is a collector's item now because it, it has the wrong dates on it. It's uh, 2018, 2019. So that's becoming, that's like that first stamp, you know, with the plane flying upside down or by mistake. Uh, but uh, so that's a we're not we're never selling that. That's how we're gonna make our retirement fund. Uh, but um, well, it's priceless, by the way. I know. Uh, but uh, one thing that that you've talked about a lot, you know, it's like Zen has become really you know a little bit overdone lately in some ways. Meditation. You know, I was joking. I had on um, 
a very well-known uh, researcher and author named Dr. Judd Brewer on the podcast last month. And he was talking about, you know, he's got meditation apps and, and he and I were talking like, you know, how something might, might have passed its prime is when, you know, Puff Daddy now has a meditation app or, you know, and I'm sure he's a very Zen, zen guy and very chill. Uh, but, uh, but you really had to deal with things uh, that tested the theory and the practice. You know, it's, it's some things work in theory, but they don't work in practice. And I'm referring to your, the event that took place in, in 20, um, it was 2015, right? When you were circumnavigating the globe equatorially and the plane that you were in a single engine piston powered plane uh went down over the strait of malacca and you almost lost your life and it was very frightening to me and my wife and my friends and all of our mutual friends how did you deal with that what kind of um impact did that make on your life and how did it change just your approach to what we call risk management uh, the citizen of the world has two propellers uh that's probably not an accident right well, uh, my good uh, friend Brian Keating had told me before I left on that trip that I um, should have a plane with turbine engines because they were 100 times more reliable. <laughs> so behind me, I have two turbine <laughs> engines, and I'm taking your advice. <laughs> but um, on that first trip, you know, I think the engine out over the Strait of Malacca at 14,000 feet, I think that that was intended to break me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a spiritual, um, with a pr spiritual perspective, you could say that that breaks you open and then you're actually ready to receive, you know, the lessons that you are intended in life. And much like my trip to the South Pole and the citizen of the world behind me, I felt like that, that broke me, you know, it took me beyond my limits. And at that point, I think I was finally ready to be open to the messages and the lessons that were out there for me. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a comfortable experience, but um, I think it's a necessary one. I saw it for you, as, as you said, this kind of brush with death uh, that led to a rebirth. Um, it was sort of this turning, you know, within you that now kind of catalyzed a new movement. Because before I, I felt like the mission made sense, uh, even nobody has to explain why human beings want to explore the world, you know, perhaps um, for, for their own purposes, their wanderlust. Uh, their desire to perhaps have new opportunities in different places. But again, as I said, you were in the Navy uh, for many years during the first Gulf War. Uh, you saw a lot of the world. You probably you know, didn't need to do that the way that you know, somebody, a land lover like myself might, uh, who hasn't seen as much of the world. So I don't think it was for that, but it was for a mission. You did it with the children of San Diego in mind, and now you're doing it with children all over the world. So I want to talk a little bit about children uh, and your various contributions, as I said, this this coloring book um, is just delightful. We have uh, this is one of our many copies. It has the Citizen of the World. It's beautifully illustrated. I'll, I'll put links to the books. Uh, talk to us about your recent book with uh, with Susan Gilbert. Uh, what what did you guys? Uh, what was your intention with that book? And um, and what has been the reaction to it uh, so far? You know, Brian. Let me address one of your earlier comments first. The uh, Zen Pilot uh, branding evolved, actually. I don't know if you can see this on my collar, but it says Peace Pilot. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think as I've evolved, the branding has evolved. And Susan and I, to answer your second question, wanted to put something out to the kids of the world at the point where they're first being inspired to fly. And if you look at general aviation today, they're focused on high school kids because in a few years, those kids will be flying. But I think that kids are inspired much earlier than that. And I was in Africa, actually at a shopping center at a restaurant, and there were two adults, and there was a little girl, and there was a plane flying over, and she looked up and pointed at the plane, and her parents didn't even notice. You know, they were just going about their business. And I thought, that little girl has just had her first exposure to aviation. So we wanted to do a children's nighttime story that spoke to the kids at the level they were at, and somehow planted that seed for you know their future um, exploration for their dreams uh, to inspire them. And I think we were fairly effective with that book, the little plane that, that could. And you know, of course, it's uh, it has a reference to the little engine that could that we all grew up with. But there was nothing for aviation, and we wanted uh, to be the ones to to plant that seed in the minds of little kids everywhere. 
Christ, it also reminds me a little bit of this book about aviation, which also has little in it, The Little Prince. I don't know if this is going to fall this but um, but as an adventure story, and that um, you know, kids really take to this notion of the underdog or the or, or the the grand mission in life. And you know, in, in a few minutes, we'll get to the big picture questions that I ask all my guests. But um, but looking at it in, in terms of wanting to inspire people. Uh, especially young people, when you get them when you're young, you're doing a lot of work with a AOPA, uh, correct? Yes, and if you could see the uh, nose of the citizen of the world, you would see their 80th anniversary logo. Uh, it's the biggest one on the plane, and I had made a promise to the senior people at AOPA that to help them celebrate their 80th anniversary, I would cross the South Pole in 2018, or correction, 2019, which I did. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, AOPA is sort of the central cog for, I think, all pilots in the United States. Yeah, um, I've, I've been a member for you know, decades now. Hopefully, they'll get a copy of this video. But I want to say, uh, in this confluence between children and aviation, you know, it's often said, uh, you know, they're, they're as, as you mentioned, you know, kids are naturally interested in aviation, but at least in the United States, the population of pilots is getting older and older. And I wonder how, in your opinion, can that be best addressed through the work that you're doing with AOPA, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association? I should actually say it for 99.9% .9 of my audience. But the uh, but why, why do you think aviation, on one hand, the popularity is seeming to decrease, whereas the popularity of space flight you know, it's just never been higher and people are so excited about it. Uh, what? How do you reconcile these two different trends they used to go kind of hand in hand the right stuff in aviation would translate into astronauts and, and interest in flying to other worlds um what do you make of this of, of this oppositional trend where you know general aviation popularity is is declining somewhat and maybe drastically you know better than i do and it's also getting older and older so that the population isn't replacing but space flight is getting even more popular especially with young people I like to think that aviation is sort of the first step on the way to space travel. And I believe most astronauts, um, not most, but many of them, you know, start off as pilots. And to answer your first question, Brian, the way we're trying to reach out to kids to help inspire them is I am working with Redbird Flight Simulators, which is the biggest uh, flight simulation company for GA pilots in the United States. And they have 3,500 simulators worldwide. And we'll be doing uh, five flight simulations for them. So any child or you know aspiring pilot will be able to get into a Redbird simulator, including the full motion ones, and actually experience the citizen of the world and fly to the South Pole. So we're super excited about that. Um, I like to think that uh, the citizen of the world will be a mobile classroom for kids to help inspire them. And I'll take it around to different museums like the Bungie uh, Aviation Museum that I'm at now. Uh, we have some interest from the Smithsonian as well. And the kids will literally be able to touch the plane, get inside the plane, and you know experience this magical aircraft that's gone pole to pole on a polar expedition. So I think you know getting the plane out there in the world will be a good first step. Certainly there are challenges of opportunity, you know, time and money for aspiring pilots and the de Laurentiis foundation will help sponsor some um, scholarships for kids to help get them involved in aviation as well you know the 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 trip is extremely expensive and it's using a lot of the resources of the foundation but at the completion of the trip then we're going to shift some of those uh, resources to uh, kids and scholarships mm. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and then sort of the last part of this, uh, uh, of the uh, travel log, so to speak, uh, portion before we get on to the big picture of life questions that I ask everybody. Um, so literally, where do you go from here? You're going to go towards a uh, fly over the North Pole, the different poles uh, in about a week or so. Uh, and then when do you return here to our hero's welcome that we have planned for you in San Diego? Um, well, as of this morning, uh, the, the schedule or the flight route changed because I was headed over to Iceland and then up to Svalbard, Norway, mm. and we found out that the camera crew can't get into Iceland uh, on the 15th. So we're trying to get special permission so that they can fly into Oslo and then go up to Svalbard, Norway, which is the northern island um, you know, for uh, Norway, and then go over the pole 
into Alaska. And then from Alaska, I have a few stops along the way. I'm going to meet some people that have been instrumental in making the pole to pole flight happen. From there, I go into Canada and do some interviews uh, with respect to an electric aircraft that's uh, being tested there. And then down into uh, Seattle, Washington to meet with uh, um, my mentor, Susan Gilbert, who I, I know you uh, have spoken with a few times. And then um, into probably San Diego International, uh, possibly with Eric Lindbergh, the grandson of Charles Lindbergh, if we can still make that happen. And then back into San Diego, uh, out to Gillespie Field. Wonderful. And we think that'll happen probably by late July, uh, early August at the latest. Um, so we mentioned space flight a couple of minutes ago. Uh, do you dream of going to space? Do you dream about extending not just you know the mission of of the De Laurentiis Foundation, but do you do you have dreams or aspirations of going farther into space, or do you feel like your most important work is here on terra firma? You know, my most important work right now, I think, is the next leg. And Eric Lindbergh uh, shared a thought with me. He said that um, the only thing that matters is your safety in your life right now. But once the trip is completed, um, I certainly want to see, you know, how far we can take the lessons that we've learned. But to answer your question directly, Brian, I, I would love to go out into space. I don't know uh, many people that would turn down an offer like that. I was uh, watching something on YouTube a couple nights ago, and just the views mm. are spectacular. So, yeah, um, it's I got a chance fingers. to interview uh, Dr. Jessica Meir uh, while she was on the space station back in January, and uh, you know she was my highest flying. Uh, podcast guest, but you're my next highest flying. <laughs> uh, and fastest sure. flying too, right? <laughs> yeah, she certainly was fast flying. And now she's back on earth and the mission really has changed her in many ways. I don't think she could have anticipated uh, her story is quite, quite amazing. And I hope someday to encourage her, uh, maybe, I don't know if she needs any help from somebody like me, but to encourage her to write her life story, because I think that, that such, uh, such adventures are inspirational and they really are the best way that we can communicate to the future generations uh, what we thought, what we felt, and store wisdom, you know, kind of like fine wine. And uh, I had the honor and pleasure of having not only Carl Sagan's daughter, uh, Sasha Sagan, who is an author on my podcast, but about a week ago I had Ann Drurian, who is Carl Sagan's uh, widow and partner uh, in all things related to cosmos. And I relayed, you know, the famous statement that Carl Sagan said that books are proof that human beings are capable of magic and that we write these little squiggles on paper. And then a hundred years later, you can have uh, somebody's voice in your head uh, that might not be alive anymore. And yet you can benefit for his or her wisdom. So I want to turn to the various books you've written and uh, and just ask you, how did you come up with the idea for the title? I always judge books by their covers, no matter what people say. Uh, how do you? Uh, but the covers, the title, and, and how, how did that happen? Did somebody propose it to you? Did it just come to you in a flash? Of, let's start with Zen Pilot, and we can go flying through life, um, and then uh, the upcoming uh, the children's book. How, how did you? Well, you already mentioned how that came about. So how how did the first two book titles come to come to you? Well, you know, it's funny, Brian, because I'm reading this book by Charles Lindbergh now. This is a 19, I think, uh, 30 edition. Um, mm. And I never even knew about this, but uh, he's talking about his early training as a pilot. Um, but to answer your question, Flying Through Life was uh, actually a creation of Susan Gilbert. We mentioned her earlier. And uh, it was her idea. It was a concept or a, sort of an umbrella that encompassed the three passions of mine, which was the flying, the business, and the spirituality. And, you know, that still remains. And this pole-to-pole -pole flight fits uh, neatly underneath that. But it was 19 spiritual concepts that I incorporated into my business, and then it tripled in size. Mm. And what I wanted to do was go out into the world and not just talk about that, but show that the concepts worked. And I would do that by doing that equatorial circumnavigation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then during that circumnavigation, I uh, had the engine out of the Strait of Malacca that I mentioned, and that's when a Zen Pilot book came into being. And the Zen Pilot portion was sort of um, a reflection of what Richard Bach had done back in the 60s. He was mm -hmm. incorporating spiritual concepts into our daily lives, but he was doing it in such a delicate manner that nobody was spooked by that, right? Because sometimes when people get a little too spiritual or religious, 
it sends people running for the hills. So Zen Pilot was a way to take the Zen moments out of the flying experience and share the things that we can learn about life from flying. Mm. And then, of course, um, the, the next book will be called Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth and Beyond, just like um, the docu-series. And the Peace Pilot to the Ends of the Earth is the South Pole and North Pole, but the Beyond is um, the spiritual component of this trip. And we know that the North and South Poles are the only two places on the planet where peace has always existed. Mm. So the goal of the mission is to connect those two places and everybody in between on this mission of world peace. So mm. it all fits very nicely together to help promote peace in the world. Ah, that's phenomenal. So then the next thing I ask about books is, would you rather have a hundred readers, uh, a year from now of any of your books or one reader a hundred years from now? Hmm. I just love to have one reader now. And it's not because we haven't sold a ton of Zen pilot. Um, it's because, you know, I think people um, can influence other people and really all we can do is be the example. And if there's just one person that gets that lesson and goes out into the world, then I think our mission has been accomplished. And certainly, you know, we want, uh, thousands or millions of people to read it, but you don't know if that person you expire or inspire is going to be, you know, Martin Luther. So somebody could read the book, like maybe your your kids, Brian, are reading or working on that uh, coloring book, and they go, you know what, I want to be a pilot. And you know, my dad teaches me about the universe. I want to go out and I want to fly. I want to become an astronaut. I want to write books like these guys. You know, you, you just don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. So I think. Um, it sounds like the the number is not as high as maybe what you would expect, but I think if we can just inspire one person to go out in the world and make a difference, that could be the difference that matters. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so now I'm going to ask a couple of questions related to sort of uh, the deep future of, of you and uh, your legacy. So the first one revolves around what's called – an ethical will, not a material will. How you're going to leave, uh, you know, your vast riches from from flying around the world and the and the plane parts and the books and everything. Hopefully, I wish you great financial success, obviously. But uh, but I'm more interested now in your ethical will. What wisdom? What uh, what what facts about you know the human soul or spirit as you've studied? What do you most want to convey to a future generation? You know, I thought about that, Brian, in the uh, 60 minutes that you gave me a heads up. The homework, it. huh? Um, more than I give I, most of my students. <laughs> Pop quiz. Um, yeah, really. Um, you know what I came up with was just uh, honor your word. And it sounds like such a, you know, a basic uh, concept, but it's such a foundation for everything that we can accomplish in the world. And, you know, you and I have had business dealings, and I like to think that um, the first promise I made to you, I honored. And then from there, you know, the friendship deepens and then we progress into new territory and we get closer. You know, we, we share what we have in terms of your knowledge and, you know, the resources that you've helped to contribute. And it just grows from there. And it, it, it just, I think, builds trust in the world. And I think it helps bring about peace in the world too. Because if you can trust what somebody's told you, and they're going to honor what they do. I think you can have you know great impact, and yeah. it builds for the future. There's a notion, at least in Judaism, you know, I'm a practicing uh, Jew, and that when somebody goes to on a trip, uh, a friend will give uh, him or her a dollar to give to charity and uh, or to, to do something good once they get to their destination. And the theory is that. Uh, you you can't be you're sort of protected or made more safe. I mean, now obviously this is not scientific, but the notion is very beautiful that you're kind of protected when you're on a mission, and and that uh, God or spirit or whoever you want, uh, Zeus or nature, Darwin is you know is protecting you in order to ensure that the good deed that you're on a mission to accomplish will occur. Uh, so it's it's a nice it's a sweet tradition. Again, you know you can't take it too seriously, uh, but it's but it's a it's a beautiful message that that you, you're on a mission and I should contribute to that as a, as I hope that I did in a small way uh, to ensure your safety and that you actually complete it because I think you you have this uh, very lofty goal for yourself and for the world. So I think that's that's quite that's quite beautiful. The next question revolves oh, around. I was going to say, Brian. Um, 
I also have something for you, and I'm going to tell you that I'm flying it uh, to the ends of the earth on this polar circumnavigation, and I'll let you know that it's a, a world peace coin. Oh, and right. we have 200 serialized coins on the plane, and uh, they may smell like Jet A1 by the time you get it, but uh, that's okay. It'll, that's... Be, it'll be infused with the energy from this trip and the planet and the poles, and I think it's going to be a pretty magical thing to hold yeah. on. Yeah, and how look how far it's traveled, literally. Yeah. Um, so actually, the next thing does may dovetail nicely into that. So thank you so much. That's very uh, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> the next topic that I ask guests uh, is really a, um, a flashback to the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which uh, I hope you've seen, where uh, there are these monoliths, these mysterious objects placed throughout the solar system that mankind is meant to encounter, and then it's supposed to um, you know, teach them or warn them, what have you. But I, I like to think of it as kind of a billion year old time capsule, something that you put in a time capsule or on it, perhaps uh, some achievement, whatever. I've had a lot of different, um, uh, you know, responses given to this question. What would Robert, what would you put on your billion year long lasting time capsule? Maybe one of these coins. I'd put the citizen of the world here because mm, by that time fit. it'll be, it'll be paid off. And, um, <laughs> and it has all the, you know, modern technology of the day. And I think, it represents, you know, the hope and the courage and the desire of the people of the planet. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful plane, but it's doing something that I think exceeds the expectations, not only of myself, because if you would have asked me if this was even possible a couple of years ago, I probably would have, you know, laughed and said, yeah, good luck with that, you know. But um, I think it's, um, it has the energy. It's been infused, and I think it's a magical instrument of of learning and of uh, knowledge and uh, of peace yeah that's very wonderful and you you presaged my final question uh <laughs> which is uh the, related to the title of this podcast into the impossible which is one of uh, sir arthur c Clarke's three laws of the universe uh which in this case is the only way to find out what's possible is to venture beyond it a bit into the impossible and I like to ask my guests, you've accomplished so much. Um, what mysterious thing or thing might have seemed impossible when you were in your 20s and 30s, like many of our listeners are, uh, but then, uh, then you went ahead and you did it, and, uh, and now you know that it is possible? I would say uh, what eluded me back then, Brian, was what is my purpose? And in my life, um, when my purpose and my passion came together, then there was an acceleration. And um, that acceleration or that purpose is, I think, this trip that I'm on now. And I reflect back and I think about all the things that are contributing to my success and they happened, you know, throughout my life. Mm. And I didn't really understand which direction I was going back then, but I'm now very, very clear that this mission is critical, not just for my development, but for the planet and for you know, all the people on the planet. So I, I think having faith and, you know, different religions uh, sort of guide you in different ways. But I think that element of faith is critical. Just believing that what's happening to you now, you know, in the early stages of your life are intended to get you to the place where you're going to go. Yeah. Well, that's really lovely, Robert. The last thing I want to say is like your propellers, I want to put you into the spin zone now and uh, ask if there's anything you'd like to promote. Where can people find you on the internet, your books, etc.? Well, they can find all the books on Amazon and uh, I would direct people to social media. If you type in Zen Pilot or uh, Robert DeLaurentis, you're going to find us on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook. Uh, and then our website is www pole p o l e two t o pole again flight so pole to pole flight and uh there's hours of reading and pictures and all kinds of information and uh they're all easy ways to contact me fantastic well as i said uh it's always a treat to talk to any of the guests and all the guests that i get the privilege to talk to on into the impossible but it's super fun when we get to talk to uh, a close friend and in this case it's none other than the man my kids call Uncle Brobert, uh, for kind of brother and Robert mixed together. Uh, we can't wait to 
hug you back when you return to San Diego. And I want to thank you for sharing your time. I know it's getting late there in, uh, in the uh, uh, parts of Northern Europe in which you're currently inhabiting. Wish you all the best, uh, not just, of course, in safety, but in achieving the, the impossible dreams that you've set for yourself. And uh, I just want to salute you for your courage and, uh, and being uh, one of my best friends. Uh, I wish you the best and I miss you. And I can't wait to see you back here in San Diego. You know, Brian, thank you. Um, really, which keep, the thing that keeps me inspired are people like you, you know, that support and encourage me along. And, um, you know, you've been a supporter since we first met many years ago when our bromance officially started. And, um, you know, I, I think about you guys. I see your logo on the plane, and I appreciate all the love your family uh, sends my way. So thank yeah, you. We do love you. Yeah. Thanks, Robert. Well, uh, if you can't tell, that was a great treat for me. Uh, a little emotional talking to my friend flying around the world. I want to thank everybody uh, for being fans of the podcast, for uh, being subscribers. I want to point you to resources you can get on my website, uh, briankeating.com. We include show notes, etc. You join my mailing list. I send those out about once a week. I promise not to overload you and spam you if you like this video uh leave a comment like it subscribe it as all the youtubers tell me to say and i'll keep making them and uh, i've got a suite of guests coming up in the next few months that i know you're all going to enjoy and uh, i always appreciate your feedback leave it in the comments below and uh stay in touch thank you guys all so much any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible, please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at Imagine UCSD. Watch us on YouTube. Listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. Patrick Coleman, Associate Director. Produced by Stuart Volko.